Well, hello and welcome to another fun-filled edition of Adam's Music Box, where today we're remembering the great Doug Engel, who died just a few weeks ago. He was, of course, the de facto leader of Iron Butterfly, wrote most of the hits, including their biggest hit, provided most of the lead vocals, and provided that quintessential organ-driven, heavy psychedelic rock sound. Now, everyone remembers the song In a God of Vida, the title track to the most uh, to the highest selling album that Iron Butterfly released it's been immortalized in a very funny episode of the Simpsons back when the Simpsons were good um Bill Nye the science guy referenced it in science programs uh, that were aimed at children and it's really entered pop culture even though Iron Butterfly themselves remain something of an anonymous uh, band uh, Doug Ingalls name is known for people who like the band and that genre of music but nevertheless, not necessarily a household name. Although he did, along with the rest of his band, make history in the late 60s. And that history is that Iron Butterfly's In A God of Vida was one of the very first rock albums to ever be the top selling Billboard album in any given year. Now, this might sound shocking because rock and roll in one form or another was well over 10 years old by the time that Inagata de Vida was released. But it took a while for this youth-oriented music to really capture the charts. But once it did capture the charts, it, hang it hung on to that those charts for about 40 years. You might not believe this, but the top selling albums prior to this late 60s era in any given year were almost all soundtracks. And there's a reason for that. When the LP record came out in the late 1940s, it was an improvement, a vast improvement in sound quality over the 78s that dominated before, and it gave artists the ability to put a lot more music on an album. Uh, an LP record can hold anywhere between 40 and around 50. Sometimes you can squeeze 55 minutes of music on a single record. Such wasn't the case at all with 78s, which were still a singles driven format and when you wanted a longer piece like a symphony or a soundtrack you needed to literally buy albums of 78s which were literally like photo albums those old things that people had before the internet where you'd have pages and photos stuck in the pages only a music album where we had 78 records in the pages and you'd turn them that became obsolete when the lp came out uh, an entire set of music that could be the length of a symphony could fit on approximately one record. Some of the longer symphonies took two, but the average symphony took one. Now, for pop music, this presented a challenge because a singles-driven format was now in the position to need to fill around 45 to 50 minutes of music on a single disc. You know, you can't just put one song on an LP. That would physically be a waste of space and it took a while for the pop world to really adapt to it that's why we had the concept of filler one two maybe three really good songs the hits on an album and the rest were throwaway tracks the filler the forgettable tracks Sinatra was, of course, one of the first people to pioneer using all of the space on an LP record to make a cohesive artistic statement free of filler. Say that three times fast, free of filler, free of filler, free of filler. Oh, I win the prize. And this was accomplished because of the concept album, which again, Sinatra pioneered. So if you're not going to have one cohesive symphony or something like a soundtrack or highlights from an opera, you could paint a picture, a cohesive artistic picture through a series of songs that were somehow thematically related. Now, it took a while longer for the rock and roll world to adapt to that, but by the late 60s, we certainly had concept albums, Sgt. Pepper being probably the first one, although you could make an argument that Frank Zappa's Freak Out had conceptual unity across two LPs. Some would also perhaps say Pet Sounds was a concept album in that it explored new musical concepts, Days of Future Past, possibly the most cohesive 
a concept album of the late 60s, the great debut of the classic lineup of the Moody Blues after they did other stuff previously with a, le- a shorter lived and less iconic lineup. But le- before we get back to the significance of In Agata De Vida, I've got a list of what the top selling albums per year, according to the Billboard charts, were prior to the late 60s. So while most of them were soundtracks, the first from 1956, when these records started to be kept, was a wonderful non-soundtrack album. It was the Calypso album of Harry Belafonte, which introduced this Trinidadian and Jamaican style music to the rest of the world. And Belafonte was, of course, a wonderfully talented, highly musical artist, great voice, so much talent, such a dynamic and interesting individual. But this proved to be the exception that proved the rule. In both 1957 and 1958, so two years in a row, the top selling record was the soundtrack to My Fair Lady. In 1959, it was also soundtrack stroke thematic based music. It was the music from Peter Gunn by the great composer Henry Mancini. Going into the 60s, it's very soundtrack heavy. Top selling album of 1960, the Broadway soundtrack to The Sound of Music. And in 1961, the Broadway soundtrack to Camelot, you know, Camelot. Da, 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 da. Um, anyway, then in 1962 and 1963, Leonard Bernstein and Stephen Sondheim got two years in a row as the number one selling soundtrack to West Side Story. In 64, Michael Crawford with the original cost of Hello, Dolly. 1965, the original cost of Mary Poppins. Now we see things start to get a bit different when we go to 1966. For the first time in a number of years, we have a non-soundtrack album that hit number one. And this was her power put in the Tijuana Bros with whipped cream and other delights. You know, that very, very iconic album cover with the woman wearing nothing but a dress made of whipped cream. You've seen it. We've all seen it. I did a video about her power put with the album cover in the background. Uh, that wasn't a rock album. It was a kind of um, hybrid pop album that could that fused traditional American instrumental pop with the sounds and flavors of Mexican mariachi style music. Um, the next year, we have something that some might call a rock album and some might call the soundtrack album. I'd call it a bit of both. It was, of course, more of the Monkees. Now, the Monkees were a band that was specifically formed as the launch pad to a television show. So you could sort of say it's a soundtrack album. You could sort of say it's a rock album. You get the idea. 68 is when we had the very first unabashed rock and roll album as the top selling album of the year. And this was the creation of an iconic artist, perhaps the most iconic ever in the rock and roll genre. And this was Jimi Hendrix experienced with Are You Experienced? Uh, experience, experienced. Anyway, let's not get tied up in grammatical coils. Now, enter Iron Butterfly in 1969. Now, they had the number one album with Inagata De Vida in the entire year of 1969. It sold more than any other album. And a lot of artists had albums that year. The Beatles, The Rolling Stones, lots of soundtracks, which still continued to sell uh, at this time. But the number one album was a psychedelic heavy rock album where one entire side of the LP was a long, mystical, psychedelic journey type of song uh, called In a God of Davida. Now, this is really significant because not only did it show that rock and roll had arrived, but it showed that a band whose members weren't a household name, the way the members of the Stones or even the Who or certainly the Beatles were, it showed that with this kind of music, they could hit number one and they could do so with a song that was possibly the least single friendly hit ever. Now, they did release an edited version as a single, but the version that everyone really remembers members knows and loves was the 20 minute full side version complete with the long organ solo the long drum solo the whole shebang 
This was significant because it showed that the purchasing power of young people was beginning to equal or eclipse the purchasing power of the older generation who wanted to listen to My Fair Lady and The Sound of Music, but with few exceptions, the kind of person that would sit back to listen to Rex Harrison sing about the rain in Spain falling, ma falling mainly in the plain were not necessarily going to listen to In a God of Davida, baby, won't you come with me? So it really showed that the youth culture, that which is what rock and roll culture was at the time, it was overtaking and they were willing and ready and able to explore music that was necessarily involved. Long drum solos, long organ solos, mumbled lyrics weren't exactly the kind of thing that would have charted just a few years earlier. So it represented a big change. And, and for those who don't know the story, the lyrics were supposed to be in the Garden of Eden, but a very inebriated Doug Ingle was slurring his words. It sounded like in a God of Davida, and the rest of the guys said, hey, you're on to something. And so that was one of those happy accidents that made a hit. Now, after this, there was no looking back. Throughout the 70s, even when you did have a couple of soundtracks, they were all derived from rock culture or from the subgenres of rock. So let's just quickly go through the top albums per year of the 70s and how different they were than the pre-rock era. So in 1970, Simon and Garfunkel, Bridge Over Troubled Water. 71, the soundtrack stroke concept album of Jesus Christ Superstar, which was very much in the rock genre when Peter, um, Peter, when when Ian Gillen is playing uh, the lead role, he was the role of Jesus in this controversial but top selling album. It's definitely rock and roll. 72, Neil Young Harvest. 73, War, a sort of rock jazz fusion album, one of my favorites, The World is a Ghetto. 74 and 75, you had Elton John, first with Goodbye Yellow Brick Road, then with his first greatest hits album. 76 was, of course, Frampton Comes Alive. We've talked about that. 77, It's Gotta Be Fleetwood Mac's Rumors. 78, a soundtrack, but by a band that even though by now they adopted disco, a kind of stepchild of rock and R&B, they started out as a kind of Baroque, if you will, rock band. And this was the Bee Gees soundtrack to Saturday Night Fever. And we round out the decade with 52nd Street by Billy Joel. In the 80s, it's all either rock or R&B. Michael Jackson, of course, with the top selling album of the uh, 80s. Asia is on there with its debut. Oreo Speedwagon is on there with High Infidelity. Pink Floyd's The Wall, Born in the USA, etc. So... Iron Butterfly really made it clear that even if you weren't superstars like Jimi Hendrix or soundtrack, you know, to TV derived rock like the Monkees, you could capture the attention of uh, the most important consuming nation in the world for the music industry. And that's the U.S. And you could do it with a song that didn't really seem commercial. If you were to shop that to the A&R guys at a record label, a 20 minute song with a really long drum solo, an organ solo, they would say eek, but that's what happened. Because as I said, when you don't underestimate your audiences, they will surprise you. So rest in peace, Doug Ingle, a very, very important man who created one of the most iconic songs, not only of the 60s, but of any era. And because of its catchy, slurred <laughs> main refrain, I think people will remember it for a very long time. Like, subscribe, and we will see you next time. Take care.